Shigeru Miyamoto and by extension Nintendo have had a great habit of establishing top-notch templates in game design for as long as I can remember. From the breakout success of the simple but addictive Donkey Kong arcade game, the groundbreaking gameplay loops of Super Mario Bros., the compelling adventure and exploration of Legend of Zelda and Metroid, they were frequently establishing the successful formulas for so many other games to follow. There had been excursions into the world of 3D gaming prior to the mid-90s, but it was in that time period that the philosophy of game design as a whole began to transition into the third dimension, some more successfully than others. Some played it cautiously and relied on more traditional two-dimensional gameplay elements for the core of their design, utilizing 3D more as a presentation element or an occasional supplemental gameplay element in which the core gameplay was still fundamentally 2D. Super Mario 64 was a landmark title for Nintendo and the gaming industry as a whole. Shigeru Miyamoto infamously had the development team spend almost half their production time on just the controls for Mario alone before any level, enemy, or obstacle design was done. As a result, Super Mario 64's excellent controls and gameplay established the benchmark for 3D platformers just as definitively as the series had in 2D. Peach. Controls aside, Super Mario 64 makes its 3D ambitions known straight away with its flyby introductory cutscene. Nintendo confidently showcases not only a fully realized 3D world, but about as flattering an introduction to it as possible. This is followed by the curated playground the game begins in. The outside of the castle allows opportunities for almost every move in Mario's skill set, each of which demonstrates gameplay concepts for the navigation of 3D space. From the various methods of jumping, climbing, swimming, and just looking around, the fun and wonder of the game becomes apparent. This design philosophy is also reflected in the paintings which teleport you to the various levels of the game. Super Mario Bros. 3 and Super Mario World had an overworld map which was navigated with simple 2D controls, a gamified abstraction of moving through an environment. Super Mario 64 ditches this approach almost entirely and places more of an emphasis on an immersive, consistent world and choices that are made by intuitively navigating it with the toolset you're given. Menu navigation is reduced to the bare essentials of choosing your save file, answering simple questions and prompts from NPCs, and choosing the particular challenge for each stage. There's something brilliantly meta and simple about the act of jumping into the paintings to access these strange new worlds. You're utilizing what is inherently a three-dimensional movement to cross the barrier of a two-dimensional surface. It's that simple yet brilliant Nintendo game design philosophy at its best. The two parts of making Mario feel so good to play are his physics and his animations. Mario has a complex and consistent physics system, meaning that his movements are both dynamic but predictable in a way that is intuitive and allows for high-level play. Super Mario 64 still holds the title for the most granular controls for Mario in any game in the series. The N64's analog stick was, of course, much more dynamic than the digital arcade sticks and control pads that had been used to control him up until that point, but this was utilized to an extent not seen in any Mario game since. The level of range and sensitivity that the game responds to with the analog stick is just insane for a game from 1996. Just check out this range of movement speed. Future 3D Mario games like Super Mario Odyssey would start to simplify the controls a bit, reducing Mario's possible movements into eight cardinal directions. Don't get me wrong, they still feel great to play, but it is interesting that the oldest game had the most complex movement system. If you're interested in learning more about the mechanics and physics of Super Mario 64, the YouTube channel Pan and Koic 2012 cannot be missed, but prepare to go down some seriously complex and awesome rabbit holes. Along with the physics, of course, must come animations for Mario, and Nintendo delivered there as well. Mario alone has 209 animations which deliver convincing, consistent, and charming movement. That, combined with Charles Martinet's iconic voice acting, truly brought Mario to life in ways that would take other 3D titles years to catch up to. Mario's skill set and 3D movement possibilities continue to expand as the game goes on, introducing custom-tailored new power-ups for Mario and the stages that the game takes place in. The wing cap gives Mario fly 
flight and gives it a distinct feeling to prevent it from feeling like airborne swimming. For example, the momentum while diving allows you to utilize downward velocity to increase your altitude like an airplane. It's an iconic item and is featured on the game's box art in all regions for good reason. The metal cap is another cool pickup that both makes Mario temporarily invulnerable to damage but also increases his weight, altering his movement physics. He's heavier so he can't run as fast, but that also means he sinks like a stone in water, again shaking up the movement paradigm of the game. Bowser himself utilizes some cool 3D physics mechanics too, like King bob who is kind of like a tutorial version. You need to circle around Bowser to grab his tail, and rotate the analog stick to pick up speed before attempting to throw him into one of the bombs surrounding the arena. In a neat animation touch, Bowser begins to lift off the ground as you build momentum before you even throw him. In the second fight with him, he stomps the arena which causes it to tilt dynamically, and Mario will naturally start sliding unless you get him in the air. There are 15 stages in Super Mario 64, 3 Road to Bowser levels, and several secret stars within the castle featuring a range of environments and challenges. In another shakeup of the series conventions up until that point, the focus is on large, dynamic stages with multiple challenges and goals instead of lots of short but ultimately similar stages like in earlier games. Creating 3D stages, especially in this cutting edge era, was significantly more time consuming and challenging than it was for 2D, and this approach allowed the developers to provide a similar amount of content to past games in a different way. It also had the benefit of introducing a level of exploration not seen in the series up until that point, while maintaining its fast action gameplay. Another interesting level design concept that both games share are corkscrew style stages, vertical structures that wind upwards with lots of content along the way. Most of the stages in Super Mario 64 are set up this way, with content that stretches upwards, maximizing gameplay opportunities within the spaces of each level. Ocarina of Time features this concept in its first and last dungeons, and given the appearance of that last dungeon with an early beta footage of the game, suggests that this was a concept Nintendo had in mind early for both. Dark Souls 1 utilizes a similar approach for almost the entirety of its setting as well, and is one of the reasons why that installment in particular features such nice level design. Like they had for their previous two console generations, the development of the flagship Mario and Zelda titles for the N64 overlapped, with ideas and concepts being shared between the two. The initial concept for Zelda 64 was what ended up as the navigation structure for Super Mario 64. The game would take place within Ganon's castle, with Link entering dungeons and other parts of Hyrule from portals within. The Phantom Ganon boss fight room is a reference to this initial concept. But the focus was on getting Mario out first as an N64 launch title, and that's exactly what happened when it was released on June 23rd, 1996. A day after Quake, another extremely important title for the world of 3D gaming, was launched on PC. After Super Mario 64's release, Miyamoto and the rest of the team dived headfirst into what would later become Ocarina of Time. The saga of the development of Ocarina of Time is possibly the most interesting in gaming, with loads of changes and mysterious gameplay elements that have driven fans crazy with interest for years. That topic warrants several hours worth of coverage alone, so I'm going to only cover a little bit here before I touch on the release game. One example of this is that Miyamoto originally wanted Ocarina of Time to be played from a first-person perspective, but this was vetoed by the rest of the team. The ability to look around in first person in the final game is a compromise, allowing players to observe and soak in the environments of the game, as well as scan for enemies, clues, and secrets. The Z-targeting system was created by one of the game's directors, Yoshiaki Koizumi. This simple yet cutting-edge concept revolutionized third-person combat and became a staple of game design in this genre. Link's standard controls normally move him in whatever direction the control stick is pushed. This could potentially prove frustrating in combat as it requires the player to coordinate in at least two axes, if not three, which is further compounded if the target itself is moving too. It's also worth considering how generally new these 3D gameplay systems would be to players in the 
mid-90s before these kinds of experiences and gameplay systems had been standardized. Z-targeting solves this issue by changing Link's controls to always be relative to the targeted enemy. Left and right movements cause Link to strafe in those directions but keep him facing the target, greatly simplifying the controls in a very intuitive way. To say this gameplay element was groundbreaking would be putting it mildly. Devil May Cry, the Soul series, and nearly every game featuring third-person melee combat has utilized it since. The first 15 minutes of Ocarina of Time are similar to Super Mario 64, in which our location is established through inventive, first-person camera movement. Like a 2 in Mario, Navi, and Zelda, and then our basic controls and abilities are introduced to us in a relatively safe gameplay environment. The game blocks access to the first dungeon, the inside of the Deku Tree, until you've proved your understanding of the gameplay and navigational mechanics, and have gained access to the equipment you must utilize inside, preventing a frustrating dead-end and backtracking scenario. You must also utilize exploration and understanding of the environment to find the Kokiri Sword. Camera management to reveal threats and better take in the environment. Climbing, crawling, swimming, Z-targeting, and shops. To help you with all of this, Navi, short for navigation, is by your side. Navi functions as a diegetic gameplay element for the player, providing an in-game reason for hints, Z-targeting, and highlighting points of interest. From the beginning, Zelda has been a series pretty good about this kind of thing, reducing gameplay abstractions whenever possible. Most games in the era of the original game had points, for example. Now points make sense in an arcade, or the kind of a game where the emphasis is proving your skill compared to your friends and what have you. Any normal person would want to beat the machine. <laughs> and you come back? Oh sure. Again? Oh sure. <laughs> Again? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it doesn't cost as much as some other things and it's legal. But a game based on exploration and adventure has no need of that, so Zelda 1 didn't include it. Neither did Adventure on the Atari 2600, a game that was undoubtedly an influence on the original Zelda. According to the manual for the original game, the hearts represent Link's life force. Hearts of course also double as a heroic metaphor. Heart can refer to a noun meaning courage, determination, or hope, fitting traits for a character like Link. Once Mido, the self-proclaimed boss of the Kokiri lets you pass, you encounter your first real enemies of the game en route to the Deku Tree. Deku Babas are large, carnivorous plants that will attack if you get too close, but are still easy on the new player because they're stationary and cannot approach you, allowing the player to back off and set the pace of combat. Their spoils are also a nice example of diegetic item collection, dropping Deku sticks and nuts, items that will be required in the dungeon ahead. The Deku Tree itself represents a complete gameplay utilization of an interesting fantasy combat concept that smoothly integrates within the setting of the game. The Great Deku Tree is basically a surrogate parental figure for the Kokiri, and appropriately, serves as the final lesson of the starting area for Link before he ventures out into the world with only Navi by his side. The music plays a large part in establishing the atmosphere of the Deku Tree. Consider the context in which you hear it for the first time. You've turned the game on, enjoyed the warm solo piano of the intro and title screen, then the familiar lullaby of the file select screen, the imposing music from Link's premonition, and the friendly and magical tunes of Link's house, the shop, and Kokiri Forest. You can even wander into the Lost Woods, but it's all a little different when you step inside the Great Deku Tree. It's a change of pace for Zelda dungeon music. Up until this point in the series, the dungeons had usually utilized moody tracks with an element of danger and suspense, but with recognizable melodies, structures, and a sense of urgency. But the Deku Tree is different. The use of gentle, slow-moving, minimalist synthesizer notes initially gives an impression of diegetic sound, like this is what being inside this living tree sounds like. The calm pace and timbre also encourage you to take your time and look around, to soak in the environment. It doesn't compel you to rush at all. It's also most likely inspired by this track by Aphex Twin, off his incredible 1994 album Selected Ambient Works Volume 2. The 
the Zelda series composer Koji Kondo would be far from the only one to take inspiration from that album. Most notoriously, large swaths of Mark Morgan's soundtracks for Fallout 1 and 2 are extremely similar as well. There's a whole interesting story about that, but that's a topic fit for its own video. Distance, depth, and verticality are the name of the game when it comes to the game design of the Deku Tree. It's no coincidence that such a structure was chosen as the first dungeon of the game. Nearly every gameplay element of the Deku Tree utilizes the concept of movement in 3D space in some way. There's the initial winding ascent upwards, emphasizing the scope of the tree. The camera automatically tilts as you approach the edges of the platforms, both for a sense of depth, but also to help the player gauge the distance of the jumps that must be made. This first platform with an inviting hard pickup almost subconsciously encourages the player to try jumping into the web at the center of the base floor. If you do so, the web reacts to the additional force of you landing on it, but it still doesn't break, hinting to the player that a larger height is required. The big sculptulas are another stationary enemy that spin, revealing their weak backsides, another example of Ocarina of Time's combat requiring the management and understanding of 3D space. The skull waltulas are smaller spiders that can be found on the climbable vine walls. If if the player tries climbing before taking them out, they'll attack Link, causing him to fall. Destroying them requires the use of either first-person aiming or Z-targeting with a slingshot, again teaching the player the importance of both of these concepts. Then there's the Deku Scrubs, who fire projectiles that can be dodged and reflected, which again, is another 3D mechanic showcase. This Deku Scrub Reflect mechanic is a safe version of the Ganon Energy Ball Volley which originated in Link to the Past. You play a more dangerous version of it later in the Phantom Ganon boss fight, and then the most challenging version of it in the fight against the real thing, which must be done without Z-targeting. The room in which you gain access to the slingshot immediately establishes what would become another trope for the 3D era of Zelda. You're locked in the room after picking it up, and must utilize the item to reopen the door, which requires scanning the environment in first person to find the target you must shoot. With the slingshot in hand, you can now take out the Skull Watchless and climb to the top level, giving you enough of a drop to break through the big web and into the lower area. The sense of speed and height as you fall is, again, something only possible in this new frontier of 3D gaming. You land in a striking teal body of water, a visual shakeup for the dungeon so far, and a nice indication of progress into the next area. This is followed by more puzzles that involve using the Deku sticks to burn away webs, a block puzzle which opens up a nice shortcut, and more. You continue to descend deeper into the Deku tree. The source of corruption, the rot, is, appropriately enough, at the bottom, at the roots. Queen Goma, the first boss of the game, is revealed in another striking cutscene, and defeating her requires use of many of the mechanics established so far. The Deku Tree and Goma end up establishing the formula for every dungeon in the game. The necessity of exploration, item usage, and straight-up combat reflexes are tested here. The game of course gets more complex and challenging past this point, but the basics remain the same. If you can make your way through the Deku Tree and beat Goma, you can beat this game. All of these elements come together to showcase the new 3D world and gameplay mechanics in a seamless tutorial. Some of the later Zelda titles sometimes struggled with obnoxious and obvious tutorial sections. Here we go, four goats in. Oh, massive goat in. But Ocarina of Time manages a nice balance between signposting and Kokiri Forest, and then invisibly yet gently guiding you in the Deku Tree. Super Mario 64 and The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time went on to become some of the most beloved and influential games of all time, radically establishing the formulas for not only their own sequels, but entire genres of gaming for the following decades. Super Mario 64 spawned an army of imitators, but none surpassed the original. Ocarina of Time remains the highest scoring game of all time on Metacritic, and, on a personal note, may be my all-time favorite as well. Without these two titles, the trajectory of gaming would have been very different indeed. This was also the last era in which Shigeru Miyamoto had direct game design involvement roles, versus the more hands-off advisory and guidance positions he's occupied at Nintendo in the last 20 years since. Super Mario 64 is the last game he's credited on as a director, and by all accounts, he may as well have been for Ocarina of Time as well, although he's officially listed as a producer on that one. But either way, I can't think of a better pair of games to close out that particular section out of what is probably the most legendary pedigree of one of, if not the, most important figures in gaming. If you asked, you know, any game designer who their favorite game designer was, 
95% of the time you're going to get the answer of Miyamoto song. It gives us great pleasure to welcome the Basket Fellowship to Shig Shigeru Miyamoto! Shigeru Miyamoto. Shigeru Miyamoto, au nom de la République, nous vous faisons chevalier de First inductee to the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences Hall of Fame, Mr. Shigeru Miyamoto.